there, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk, In Search of Christianity. As we continue on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount, the penultimate, the ultimate teaching of what Christianity should be. Do you yes. agree? Yes. Okay. We now, concur. Now that, everybody, <laughs> now that everybody's playing, and you have to play out there too, play along, okay? We left off, uh, we're talking a little bit, or just introducing the fact that we we're going to talk about the Law and the Prophets in our last program. So that's where we're going to begin. In Matthew 5, I'm going to look at verses 17 and 18. But before we do that, I need to ask, Father, that you would just bless our time together, that you would bless our time in your word, Lord God. Lord, that you would use this time in our lives to draw us closer to, to make us more like your Son, Jesus Christ, who is the Word. So, Lord, open the, the eyes of our hearts so we would see wonderful things in your Word, Lord God. Our desire is to be closer to you, to be more like your Son, Jesus. So we praise you and thank you that you are the potter and we are the clay and that you are molding us and shaping us into that image. We bless your holy name, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> I will give you a fair warning right now. This may seem, it may seem a little boring to you today, what we're going to cover. You are allowed to yawn, <laughs> but pay attention. Okay. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. I'm going to start with verse 17. Jesus said, Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Hallelujah. Amen. Do you believe that? Yes. Yes. Then why are we so convinced today that we are not under the law, that the law has virtually no meaning? Yes, Jesus came to fulfill it. But he's saying here that it's still, right, until heaven and earth pass away. Because Not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law. Well, Jesus is still alive. But heaven and earth haven't passed away, have they? <clears throat> Jesus is the law. Right. He's still alive. He's... Okay, that's, that's, I, uh, that's all right. I don't buy it, but that's all right. But okay. also Paul said that... Uh, the law is a tu is a tutor for us, and somebody said that um, the the sat the sat the Sabbath or the law okay, yeah. was made for right. me and not the man said the law. He didn't say the law. He said the Sabbath. Right? Well, they go no. hand in hand. Okay. He said the Sabbath. We'll get okay. into that. Okay, but he didn't say the law. He, he said the Sabbath. the Sabbath, and it's important. I mean. It, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to change the word, okay? okay. And I, I wanted to, where I'm going to go right now, I believe is truly important. But like I said, it's, you have to bear with me. And like I said, you can yawn, but pay attention. George Santayana said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Okay? So we're going to talk about the, the law and the prophets more with an emphasis on the law. Because it seems to me, and this is not just a vague impression, I mean, you know, I've been blessed to travel to a lot of countries, a lot of different churches, a lot of different denominations, and I see that attitude, well, the law doesn't really matter, okay? That's the attitude I see. Well, Jesus doesn't agree with that. If you read and understand what he said in Matthew 17, he doesn't agree with that. And listen to this statement. Now, remember, God is not a man that he should change. That's what he said. Jesus Christ, who is the Word, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. It says in Isaiah, Isaiah 33, 22, For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. Okay? And then in the New Testament, in James, James 4, 12, it says there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. So it's clear to us, is it not, both in the Old and New Testament, that the law comes from God. Yes. Okay? God, God didn't give us anything that's bad. Right? 
But then we get to this place where in the New Testament, Paul wrote to the Galatians, and I'm sure you probably know this verse, where he said, Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, right? But he didn't abolish the law. He didn't abolish the law. But here's, reading comprehension matters, mm -hmm. okay? Did, did Paul say, did you receive the Spirit by the law or by hearing with faith? You say, hmm? It's got to be one or the other. Right. No, he didn't say that. He said, did you receive yes. the Spirit by the works of the law? Mm. Okay, and I want to get into this because this, you know, all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable. Mm -hmm. There's no words in here that don't matter. That's right. So when Paul says the works of the law, he's not talking about the, the, law, the law is bad because Paul is one who will tell you the, the law is good and the law is holy. It's when we depend on working the law that we think we achieve righteousness with God. So good works. Let me just, Deuteronomy is a law, right? Part of the law. Leviticus is part of the law. Did Jesus believe in Deuteronomy? I have a yes from the decide. The answer to that is, I'm going to say no. Listen up, Heresy. Listen up, listen up. It's not that Jesus believed in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Jesus is Deuteronomy and Leviticus. He is the Word. He is the Word made flesh who dwelt among us. So he is the law. He is the law. He is the Word, all right? It's not that he thought, oh, that's good. That's good. He is the very Word of God, made flesh who dwells among us. Now, that's why I said this is going to get, you've got to pay attention. And not to me. You know, I've said a lot of times, it'd be really good to take notes. And then you go and you sit down and you have serious discussions with the Lord God Almighty about what I'm saying to you. Because I'm not asking you to take my word for anything. I'm asking you to test all things and hold fast that which is good. If you think about it as what you just said, because Jesus is Deuteronomy, he's Leviticus, he's he is Exodus, the, he, is, he is the Word. That puts a whole new look. I hope that it does. It. I hope that it does. Because it should change the way we think yes. when we realize. And I'm going to talk about this a little more as we get into this for sure. But I've said this often, and, and I, I ask you to receive this as prayerfully as I give it. There is a difference between the Scripture and the Word. Absolutely. The difference, I've said that many times. The difference is you can know the Scripture without knowing the Word. Yes. The example is, look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees literally knew Scripture backwards and forwards, but did not recognize the Word when he walked through their midst. Okay? There's a very big difference. There is, okay? I'm, I want to read you what Paul wrote in, in Romans. Now, this, if you want to find a, a letter that truly reveals God's plan and our under, what our understanding should be of the law, it's the letter to the Romans. The letter to the Romans, by the way, is the letter that God used to touch the life of Martin Luther that led to the entire Protestant Reformation. Okay? I'm going to read from Romans, verse, chapter 7, verses 6 through 12. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which, by which we were bound, so that we serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting, coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me, coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. It was sin that did it, right? Yes. So then, he says in verse 12, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So if you think that Paul has thinks that the law is bad, you don't understand. What Paul thinks is that 
trying to achieve righteousness by working the law is impossible. So Jesus, back in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, he goes on to say, in verse, okay, whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 19 and 20. So Jesus is saying here, okay, whoever keeps and teaches the law, the word of God. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Where did these commandments come from? God is the lawgiver, right? It's our understanding that is failing, not the word, right? When Paul, now remember, this is this is way after this is after the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's after the day of Pentecost. When Paul was imprisoned in Caesarea, he was on trial before the governor Felix, and and uh, Ananias, the high priest, was there too, right? With some of the Jewish elders. I mean, a whole bunch of them are there. But here's what Paul said. But this I admit to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, I do serve the God of our fathers, believing everything that is in accordance with the law and that is written in the prophets. Acts 24, 14. Got that? He doesn't say, well, I don't believe it anymore. He says, I believe everything. Yes. <clears throat> All right, so here's where I'm going with this. In the early church, now remember, we wouldn't have all these New Testament letters had there not been error in the church. Right? Sure. I just mentioned, like the Galatians, oh you foolish Galatians, Paul said, who has bewitched you. Paul is writing to correct them. For the word of God, all scripture is God breathed and profitable. It's profitable for training, for in righteousness, for teaching, for correction, for reproof. So he's correcting them. Most, most of what we see in First and Second Corinthians is correction. Yes. All right, and it's all through. All right, that's not a bad thing. God disciplines those whom He loves. So there was error in the early church that God was speaking to and dealing to, but the the single biggest heresy that arose in the early church that truly had an impact on the church was called the Marcionite heresy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of that? Yes. I'm sure you did. Mm -hmm. The Marcionite heresy was the first major heresy that truly rocked the early church. It was a teaching that started with a guy named Marcion. That's where it comes from, from Sinope. Around 145 AD, he taught that the teachings of Jesus and the Apostle Paul could not be reconciled to the teachings of the Old Testament, and, and nor to the God of the Old Testament. Right? So he therefore concluded that the God of Jesus and the God Yahweh of the Old Testament were two different gods. That's what he taught. <clears throat> That's the Marcionite. That's the Marcionite heresy. This is very important. As I say, it rocked the early church. All right? In his mind and his, his teaching, the law and the prophets bit the dust. Now, that's the very law and prophets that Jesus just got through saying. We're to hold to till heaven and earth pass away. So somehow he missed something, right? Yes. So he developed what's called a canon of the scriptures. You know what canon of the scriptures is? That's a list of, or an understanding of what, what books, what letters, what prophecies, and so forth, constitute, make up scripture. Right? And his canon of scriptures was primarily based on his version of the Gospel of Luke, right? Not, not the Gospel of Luke, but his version of the Gospel of Luke, and some, but not all, of Paul's letters. Jesus was no longer the promised Messiah of Israel, right? And Marcion was the first one to separate the Old and New Testaments, something that still affects the church today. When Paul wrote to Timothy and said, all scriptures God breathed, I want, I want you to know he's talking about Genesis. Yes. He was talking about Exodus. Yes, he was. He was talking about Deuteronomy, Levitic, Leviticus, and, and, and Numbers, the book of Numbers. Mm -hmm. that's, that's God speaking. Mm -hmm. All right? Somehow we seem to have made 
all of the Old Testament scriptures, at least ones we don't like, second class, in the church today. There is no such thing, no verse of the Bible is second class. Only people's understanding of them is second class. Now, this is important. I, you know, I've, I've had the blessing to be able to travel on five continents, and I've been in 50 countries. I have taught in churches of probably 25 different denominations. It is the most common thing I find is that people make the, the Old Testament second-class scriptures. They set it aside. Well, they don't set the whole thing aside because they'll pick and choose verses that they like. But the ones they don't like, they can just put aside and say, well, that's the Old Testament. It was Marcion and his, his heresy that brought about the division in the first place. If you were to go through and take out all of the Old Testament quoted in this new scripture, you don't have much left. You wouldn't have much left. You'd have a nice, very, very thin Bible to carry around, I promise you would. Okay. So, what happened was, the response of the church to Marcion was to excommunicate him and establish a new, a, a, a canon of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation that is now agreed upon by the church. With the exception of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, and some of the other uh, Orthodox churches. They added right? books. Well, the Roman Catholic Church added deuterocanonical books, is what they're called. Right? Those are deuterocanonical. Literally means second canon. Okay. But we'll get into that because I want to talk a little bit about Martin Luther and the Council of Trent. Right? And like I said, listen. If you find this not, if you were looking to come here and just have me give you verses, get you all excited, hop up and down. You need to understand the scripture. You need to study the scripture. You need to know the scripture. It says study to show yourself approved. All right? There is a purpose for this. You need to be abiding in God's word and you need to know. Listen, he says he reveals himself, his divine nature through what he's created. Spend more time in this study. Get into this, all right? Martin Luther, he, he lived from uh, 1483 to 1546. He was a priest. He was a monk. He was a professor of theology in the University of Wittenberg, Catholic, all right? And in October of 1517, he posted what you probably heard of, the 95 Theses. That's just a common name. It actually has a long Latin title. Or the title is, The Disputation of Martin Luther on the Power and Efficacy of Indulgences. Okay. That's what the 95 Theses are actually called, right? <laughs> so, what, what they wanted to do was, this was a reaction from Luther to the sale of indulgences. Now, if you don't know what indulgences are, hopefully by the end of this you'll know a little bit better about them, right? Because you need to know. The purpose of selling indulgences, which was there's the, the Catholic belief in purgatory. So when, when a believer dies, what happens is he goes to this, quote, what it is, is a temporary hell, to pay the price for his sins before he is pure enough to go into heaven. As opposed to the teaching of Jesus, or the Word, which says, He hung on the cross and said, It's finished. He paid the price for our sins, right? But they believed that then, because that was the only thing that was taught by the, by the Roman Catholic Church. But if you had a loved one who died, now you could be confident that that person was suffering the pains of hell, at least temporarily. But if you paid a price, cash money we're talking about here, well, then the Catholic Church would release him from that purgatory. They had the power to do that. So... A scam. A very profitable scam, because they use that to build St. Peter's Basilica in, in Rome, right? At the Vatican. Luther was also reacting to the corruption that abounded in the hierarchy of the church of his time. I mean, we're talking about a period of time, he read the works of Savonarola. I don't know, he was a monk in Florence who called Pope Alexander, the, I guess it's the sixth, out. Maybe you know him as Borgia. Oh, I've heard that name. Yeah, he was, he was the, the Borgia, yes. I mean, utterly sinful and corrupt, all right? So they killed Savonarola. They tortured him and killed him because he spoke against the corruption that was in the church. Martin Luther was quite familiar with that. Again, teaching theology. And he had read the works of Savonarola. So that was it. This is his reaction. But there was a reaction to Luther from the church. 
and, and the foundational truth of his Reformation was the battle cry that, you ever hear these, sola scriptura yes. and sola fide, yes. only the word, only faith, right? The Catholic Church, Pope Leo X excommunicated him, listen to this now, and they declared him an outlaw, allowing anyone to kill him without any legal consequence, mm. right? They made an open season on Martin Luther. They put out a contract. They put out a contract on him. And also what, what happened was this led to, as Alice mentioned, the Council of Trent, which went from 1545 to 63. Now, during that council, one of the things they did is they added these deuterocanonical books. In other words, they added books, entire books, to the Bible. And the reason they did that was they they were justifying their their, 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 their practices, yeah. their practices and traditions that didn't line up with the word. Mm -hmm. they, the Maccabees had prayed for the dead. Well, that, I don't want to talk about that. I mean, because well, be, be, that was one of the things. Yeah. All right. Um, the obvious reason for this was to justify their Catholic teaching, right. which were challenged by Luther as being contrary to the word. And some of those things were some, not all. Salvation by works, mm -hmm. indulgences for sale, mm -hmm. praying for and to the dead, mm -hmm. and an elite priestly caste. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell you all the books. There's an, quite a number of books that were added to, and even some parts added to existing books. But in the book of Sirach, which is an addition that they made, it says alms, giving, yeah. makes atonement for sins. That's in Sirach 3.30. So in other words, you can pay. To get your sins forgiven. Yeah, you don't have to go to the priest, you just pay. Right. right. And in the book of Tobit, it said the same thing. Alms deliver from death and shall purge away all sin. Wow. So they're saying that you can pay to get rid of your sin. Now, it's for sale. And this, this was the teaching of the Catholic Church, but at the Council of Trent, it became the official teaching. And they, they made it part of Scripture. So they, that's the doctrine? They, they added to the Word. Okay, and Mark mentioned Maccabees. Now Maccabees, there's two books of Maccabees, first and second Maccabees, which were kind of a history of the of, of the war. Inter, we call them intertestamental war, right? And in the book of Maccabees, in the second book of Maccabees, soldiers took up an offering. Now after a battle, they took up an offering to provide for a, a, a ex, for sacrifice for their dead comrades. Okay. To take away their sin. And this is a quote. They pray and made atonement for the dead that they may be absolved from their sin. So they're doing things to try and get sins removed from people who have already died. That's in 2 Maccabees chapter 12. Now those are just a few minor examples of the Roman Catholic Church adding to God's word to justify their unscriptural practices. Am I upset now? Testing. Hey, you know. Where did I learn this stuff? Well, I did graduate work in a Catholic seminary. That's where I learned most of this stuff. And then I went out and studied more and more and more. Of the Word. Of the, of the Word, yes. And history. Mm -hmm. History is very is, important. Well, you know why history is very important? Because it is His story. Yes. There is no period of time when God is not active in, the li in, in human history, right? Mm -hmm. So... With those additions that they made, they did exist in, in, in Old Testament times. Mm -hmm. These books, the first and second Maccabees, I mean, Tobit and Sirach, uh, Bell and the Dragon, which they added to the book of that, mm -hmm. these existed in Old Testament times. However, the Jews never accepted them as scripture. Mm -hmm. You gotta understand that, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason that that's important is because Paul says in Romans, in chapter 3, verse 2, that the Jews were entrusted with the oracles, the word of God. They were trusted with it, and they did not make this part of the of, of Scripture. Because they, they recognized that it's not right. Now, do I have to read Deuteronomy? I mentioned Deuteronomy a couple of times. Deuteronomy 4, I'm going to read verses 2 and verse 24. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now, that's not the only place that mentions that. 
It mentions it in the New Testament. It mentions it in the Old Testament. And God says, if you ask my word, all of the curses of the word are going to come upon you. So, remember, like I said before, after the death, the resurrection, and the burial of Jesus Christ, after the day of Pentecost, Paul, the most ardent voice against believing in righteousness, by the works, obtained by the works of the law, said that the law is holy and good. Okay? We had a problem here. We had a problem in as much as most churches are saying, well, the law is over and done with. That was for them. Well, but, the, but that is in direct contradiction to the teaching of Jesus Christ and for your information to the teaching of the Apostle Paul. All right? Is that important? Yes, most it is important. It is particularly important in these perilous last days when that liar, that father of lies, the one who is a liar by nature and the father of lies, is so hard at work to deceive believers and take us from the place that God wants us to be. He wants us dead. The Word of God is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. And He is life. If Satan can get you away from the truth of the Word, he is getting you away from the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, and, and, that God, and he said, that God, who also made us adequate of servants of a new con covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 2 Corinthians 3, 5. We need to understand how to live in the Spirit of the Word. In Deuteronomy, in Leviticus, in Numbers, in Exodus, in Genesis, in all the law. It's a praising Spiritually. Because it is. If it, if it is the Word, it is Jesus. If it is prophecy, you know what? The spirit of prophecy is, I'm going to say this backwards, is the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. All right? And like I said, you can know the Scripture without knowing the Word. And there's a lot of that going around. The Pharisees were expert in the Scripture, just like I said and did not recognize the word in their midst. And so Jesus said, John 8, 43, Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Jesus did not know Deuteronomy or Leviticus. He is Deuteronomy. And Leviticus. Should you take any verse and say that it is not not for today, it's your understanding of it is not for today. Mark said in the beginning, you know, the poor, you know, the the, the, the the law, no, the law is a, a, a tutor to lead us to Christ. The greater your understanding of the law is and the prophets, the greater your understanding of Jesus will be, right? Well, we're, we're basically out of time, but I'm going to pick this up again when we come back on our next time, because I want to talk and really talk about what it means to be under the law. Father, I just thank you. I thank you, Father, for the law. I thank you for the prophets that you sent to bear testimony of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for every word that is written from Genesis, from the beginning of Genesis to the end of the prophet Malachi. Lord God, words that lead us to your son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Just bless your name. Till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will play.